for all of the dogs and cats that are using experiments in the United States, it costs about $3.5 million a year of taxpayer money that just goes to killing healthy animals. You've done terrible things. Don't put them down. The Maine Retirement Act is the first step. She was in a laboratory as well. The study that she was part of was studying, they injected him with lugworm. We're not even talking about the testing, just let them go when it's over. And it's been so freaking hard. Come on, this is ridiculous. This is not a black and white issue. There's not those who love animals and those who do not. In labs across the country, they are treated as lab equipment. Every year in the United States, over 22 million animals are tested on in government-funded science labs. But what most people don't realize is that it's not just rats and mice in these tests, it's also dogs and cats. But what's even more controversial is that there are currently no federal laws preventing these science labs from euthanizing healthy dogs and cats once the experiments end. But a new law called the Humane Retirement Act is currently awaiting action in Congress. If passed, this law would require science labs to give healthy dogs and cats a chance at adoption once testing concludes. Uh, so my name is Frances Chun, and I am a animal rights lawyer. And after I finished law school, I moved to Washington, D.C. to continue my work now with RISE, um, and I lobby Congress. H.R. 2850, or the Humane Retirement Act, the goal of this bill is on the federal level to require that federally funded research facilities, those getting money mostly from the National Institutes of Health, those institutions, after using animals in experiments rather than euthanizing them, which is what they typically do and have grant money to support, rather than killing them at the end of the experiment, they instead give them adoption consideration. H.R. 2850 is especially important because it would save taxpayer money. Right now, these federally funded research experiments are budgeted so that they can pay for euthanasia of healthy animals after the conclusion of the experiment. Now, for all of the dogs and cats that are used in experiments in the United States, it costs about $3.5 million a year of taxpayer money that just goes to killing healthy animals. The Humane Retirement Act was introduced by Representative Rice and also Representative John Kako, also of New York. In the way legislation works is after something is introduced, then you know you need people on the ground who are having these meetings to show that this is a supported type of law and it gives the momentum behind the law. And I've been working to build support for this bill so that it can be enacted into law. Basically what I do is I meet with lots of different representatives in the House of Representatives. I've had over 150 meetings uh, on the Hill regarding this specific legislation. A majority of Americans, 52% oppose animal experiments. Now, if you say that they're happening to dogs and cats and that they're getting brain surgery without any pain management, those numbers skyrocket. The FDA and NIH have cited that between 92 and 95% of animal tests that are considered successful in the animal model then fail in human models. I think it's because we're not dogs and while they're very much like us, they aren't good models for understanding human conditions. There's a reason that alternatives are becoming more popular. It's because animal testing isn't working. The most reliable thing about animal testing is that it's cruel and it causes pain to animals.
it's getting passed pretty consistently since 2015 on the state level. It is really indicative that this is something that needs to happen federally. Once a lot of states do something, the federal government does tend to look at it more closely. Do you feel like the Humane Retirement Act is enough? The Humane Retirement Act is the first step. The HRA only applies to dogs and cats in the way that it's written currently in the bill form. So this is a necessary step. It's a long overdue step and it's not going to, it's not going to solve the problem, but it's going to help chip away at it. And the next legislation that we work on, going to chip away at it again. It's really a no brainer of a kind of law. It doesn't affect the experiments. They just get to potentially go to loving homes. I'm here at Humane CNY to speak firsthand to an organization that helps rescue these animals from laboratory testing facilities. My name is Scott Taylor and this is Henry. I, I think that uh, I think he made out well. I know there's dogs that don't make out that well after laboratory adventures. He's got a few things that have happened since we've had him. He has little minor seizures once in a while. Laboratory or not, he's, he's turned out to be a really good dog. Haven't you, buddy? Maureen Davison. I'm with Humane CNY. I also run Bernard's Beagle Rescue and Misfits Animal Rescue. I've been actually rescuing laboratory animals since prior to the act was passed. So I have a, um, a couple connections in the laboratory and I've probably got about 500 animals in the last five years. Not all laboratories treat them the same. The one where Henry came from, um, I did get a few from there that tails were broken probably from being slammed in the, in the crate, so maybe the people tending to them weren't as, you know, sympathetic and empathetic. Laura White, and this is Tinkerbell. She was uh, four years old when we got her, and she was in uh, a lab for genetics and embryo testing. When I first had her, you couldn't walk a broom by her without her screaming and running away. And a certain sweater I wear, I don't know if it looks like a lab coat, she hates that too. You know, it's uh, loud noises, sometimes she gets upset with that. But uh, for the most part, she's very well adjusted and she's a good girl. It's horrible, I, I just can't see it. How about you, do you think it was bad? Yeah, I mean, I know they use beagles because of this. They're, they're, they're little, they're easy to handle, they're friendly. The thing that makes them so sweet is the thing that makes them so vulnerable. I have heard this. I have heard from the NIH itself say that the reason that they choose beagles is because they are extremely eager to please they're easy to manage and they're so food oriented that they can do a lot with them because they can convince them to do so much, yes. Uh, and that's, that's sad, uh, uh, you know, perhaps beagles should be bred to fight back. <laughs> yeah. I've seen films of things going on in laboratories and they're horrible. Absolutely horrible. What is it like in these labs? It's terrifying. They're used as lab equipment. No experiments is illegal. They can do anything they want so long as they file the proper paperwork. RISE uses the Freedom 
of Information Act on the federal level and every single state's public records laws to get public information about these, these universities and different labs that shows the public what's happening. You know, monkeys are accidentally burned while they're in surgery. We've seen cases of a cat who didn't get out of the cage fast enough and went through the washing machine and died, drowned. She was in a laboratory as well. I believe the study that she was part of was studying, they injected him with lugworm and then used some new methods of treating it. The, the animal testing for cosmetics. Because the dogs don't wear makeup, so what do they care? They're not just equipment. They're living, breathing things. Um, hi, my name's Shannon Keith, and I'm the president and founder of Beagle Freedom Project. Um, I was hoping you could share some of your thoughts and how you're involved with the Humane Retirement Act. Sure. Beagle Freedom Project started a legislative campaign called the Beagle Freedom Bill back in uh, 2013. What that was, was um, a legislative effort to retire dogs and cats from animal testing facilities who are healthy enough to um, live in homes and have a second chance at life. Um, the thing is, is that it's not mandatory uh, at all for animals to survive after the testing is over. And this is this is something that had never been heard of before. And most facilities didn't even know they they could actually adopt out animals after the testing was over. Kathleen Rice, she liked the Beagle Freedom Bill and sort of took our language and introduced it as a federal bill. So what is the next step for your organization? Because I know the Humane Retirement Act is currently pending action in Congress. Do you have any other plans for the future on um, where to go from here, maybe to help it become passed? Yeah, so um, we are trying to get just more people on board and spreading the word about it. Of course, the pandemic put everything on hold. Um, so hopefully next year. Um, and to me though, you know, it's an exciting, um, it's an exciting piece of legislation, but it's not the end all be all. It's just, to me, one little step in that direction. It doesn't even touch the testing element, right? It just says, let them go when the testing is over. Um, so it's a great first step. Let's just try to get past this tiny little hurdle, which we all thought was gonna be so easy. Like, this is a no brainer, right? We're not even talking about the testing, just let them go when it's over. And it's been so freaking hard. It, you have to think like, what? makes it so difficult to pass this little tiny bill to just get them into a home when the testing is over. Come on, this is ridiculous. The legislative process takes a long time. It's step by step, um, but man, it's taken a long time. It takes a long time for people to actually understand what that means. You know, people write to us and say, what's, you know, just end animal testing. You know, just, just write a bill that ends animal testing. And it's like, okay, you don't understand. We can't even get a bill passed that lets the animals go after the testing's over. How are we gonna end animal testing overnight? That's not gonna happen. When I first started this film, I intended to solely focus on the Humane Retirement Act. However, upon researching the industry further, I discovered that there's this dark underbelly that not only supports animal testing, but profits off of it. All over the country, there are commercial breeding facilities that create animals exclusively to be sold to science labs. Marshall Bio Resources, also known as Marshall Farms, is located in North Rose, New York, and is one of the largest commercial breeders in the world. Most of the beagles that we deal with in this area come from Marshall Farms. I know for sure that Tinkerbell was from Marshall. The, the idea that people breed 
beagles specifically for laboratories. That to me is the worst thing in the world. They trademark certain types of animals. So they have the Marshall Beagle, um, the Marshall Ferret. They've told me that they could make anything I want them to make. If I want them to make um, a three-legged dog, so that I could do a certain type of testing, that they would do that for me. They always have beagles. They use them for domestic testing. They send them out. They also do it internationally. Any given time, they have 23,000 dogs any day. The thing about Marshall is that it has a high level of secrecy. If people knew how many animals they were torturing and the fact that they have a factory farm of dogs on their campus in New York, people would be infuriated. It's very difficult to make any headway with, with them. I know there's a lot of groups trying. Since 2007, the USDA has investigated them and has cited them over 20 times. This ranges from not having adequate care from veterinarians, from not having enough space or having filthy conditions where the dogs are living in their own filth on wire metal cages. They are very hard to get into they don't speak to anybody it's pretty much a maximum security there and you have to wonder like if they're that paranoid what are they hiding right marshall bioresources is the reason that i went to law school somebody will eventually sue marshall i want to be that person Since Marshall wouldn't speak to me by phone or email, I decided to make the trip to visit them in person. My name is Mary Anatoly. I was the um, documentary filmmaker. I had emailed a few times about speaking. Um, I hadn't heard back from Marshall directly, and so I thought I would just come ask if anyone would be willing to speak for the documentary. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not? Okay. While I wasn't totally surprised that no one would speak with me, I was a little disappointed. Okay, well, I'll let them know that you stopped by. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Marshall Bioresources is, you know, one of the most heinous um, companies in the world. I actually went there a couple of weeks ago to visit them in person. That's brave because they're really scary. They were probably following you from at least five miles down the road. They're like to think that they are untouchable. It just they just get slaps on the wrist because, well, they've got the whole town, you know, in their pocket. North Rose. I noticed they had donated a park, it looked like Marshall Park. Um, so yeah, it did seem like they were a large presence there. Yeah. They fund that whole area. It's because people don't know. I mean, they're hidden, as you see with Marshall. It's like, to get there to even see that place. We went up there a, um, a couple of years ago and interviewed people in that area. Some of the people didn't even know it existed. Really? They're cold, calculated, 
just disgusting company that um, hopefully one day will be out of business. My name's Paula Clifford. I'm the Executive Director for Americans for Medical Progress. I'm Jim Newman, and I am the Communications Director for Americans for Medical Progress. I just wanted to touch on Marshall Bio briefly, just because um, I did hope to speak with them. I was just wondering if you could shed any insight onto who Marshall Bio is. Um, they provide uh, research animals for, for research. There's a lot of propaganda, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of emotional things that are said. Marshall is a very well-respected company um, with lots of great resources. You know, from my experience, they um, have a, a, an excellent animal welfare program. They take very good, of, good care of their animals. And that's why the research community, you know, involves their, their animals in, in research when, when needed. Whenever I see one of those videos come out, I always am watching it like, okay, because I, I don't, I uh, will not support any, anybody in research that's, that's not treating animals humanely. None of us would, they should be shut down, you know? So, so nine times out of 10, when I watch the video, what's happening is normal veterinary procedures, you know, normal, whatever, you know, cause I'll be like, oh, that animal's under anesthesia having surgery. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Or whatever. Right. No, I, that's, I, I that's saw why. some videos last week where it was exactly that. It was some animals that had um, procedures. And I would say from somebody who's attended many, many um, patient surgeries, that's exactly what you would see in a patient surgery. So it's a little puzzling as to why they think that that is somehow abuse when, you know, an animal is getting the same anesthesia that a person got and was treated the same exact way. It's tough though, because I can see that easily because I'm trained, I'm a veterinary technician, you know, I know animal behavior, I know procedures, but for somebody from the general public to see that, it, it is frightening, it is horrifying um, without the context. We actually created a website called Come See Our World with the very intention of getting accurate, current um, images with context out there so that people can, you know, have an opportunity to try to educate themselves on really what it looks like. My big passion is animal welfare. In the scientific environment, we need people that are driven primarily by their passion for animals. Um, from your position, do you support the Humane Retirement Act? Paula, why don't you go ahead? Um, well, I mean, I, I support the uh, adoption of retired research animals for sure, um, but uh, I don't feel comfortable with, with legislation that, that's passed just for the, um, uh, I guess, PR of it, maybe. Um, I, I think, you know, unless it's done in, a, in the right way. This is not a black and white issue. There is not those who love animals and those who do not. Many institutions, many states already have systems in place to make sure that research animals can be adopted out when that's possible. To see something like that become a law seemed a little, I don't know, not needed in my opinion. So what is the system right now then that you guys are speaking of that's already working? Um, so what, what's happened for a long time now is, is at the end of the study, if the animal does not have to be euthanized as part of the study, um, people will ask to adopt them out. So it's not like they, there's a, a funnel for them to go to the local shelter or anything like that. Typically, people who have been working with the animals are the ones who, who, that adopt the animals out. I got to show you something. Uh, where is it? Oh, God. This is, um, this is Bernie, actually. He's a retired research dog. Um, I actually adopted him in 2004. And again, the concern is um, throwing out a system that works very well in favor of something that's opposed by some, or that's proposed by somebody who has an agenda. You know, let, let's be very um, truthful and factual here. The reality is animals involved in research are frequently euthanized and humanely euthanized. Um, but that's because, um, you know, that's the, the data we're trying to generate. And the data that we get from those studies benefits a much larger group of animals and humans than, um, so yes, it is a sacrifice. And, and, and animals in research, especially dogs, they're a very small number of dogs. It sounds like a lot, 60,000 a year, which is a big number. Um, in context of all animals involved in research, I think it's less than 0.5%. You know, and, 
I think what's really, really important is to, to put this into context, because if we only focus on the use of animals in research and not what comes of that, then I think um, we're not looking at the full picture. So let's look at mm -hmm. the full picture I would suggest is COVID-19. There's no way we could have developed all these things so quickly and responded so quickly without animal studies. That's just fictional to suggest that. There are certain bureaucrats at institutions who definitely don't feel good about this type of law. To us, they're not lab equipment. Um, it, it is very interesting because I have worked very closely with some of the people who work in some of the laboratories. And it's a very interesting dynamic because in one aspect, they speak of them and they talk about them like they are lab equipment. But then on the other half, when it's time for them to leave, they can't wait for them to go find a home. So I think a lot of these workers there are a little bit torn between the two, but to us, they're pets and we can't wait to get them out of there to start their life. It's wonderful that, you know, it's getting passed or in New York and then hopefully nationwide it will be because it's, it's just a, a wonderful thing for these poor animals. Instead of having them be euthanized, they can go on to live a, a life where they're, they're loved. You know, in a family and uh, get taken care of the right way. Okay, so you've had them, you've done terrible things. Don't put them down. Let them have a year or two or five or whatever of a good life with somebody. Let them run in a field. They have a pretty good life now and I'm glad we could give it to them. The post-research adoption laws are law in 12 different states and they are pending in another six you know, very long overdue. So the most powerful thing you can do, you can do from your bedroom, go online, reach out to your representatives and tell them to support animal protection legislation. You can also follow any of our work at RISE. We do post when we're working on certain legislation and you can reach out based on our action alerts. And this is just in general, is that people can help by shopping cruelty free. Number one, that's so easy to do, right? And we have an app called Cruelty Cutter. It's a free app you can download on your phone. You scan um, the product's barcode and it instantly tells you if that product is cruelty free. Everybody has something they can do to make a difference for animals and make a change. And I'm happy to speak to anybody, contact us through the website, and we'd love to have any help that anybody wants to offer. Ultimately, what we have to do is take incremental steps that's gonna make the world a little bit more humane for the animals in labs. But it's worth it because these animals deserve to have better lives outside of labs.